thanks, Christine, and thanks, uh, Carla, and thanks for all the people who uh, work so hard to keep uh, Philadelphia Stories uh, operating. Um, I also want to thank everybody for coming out. Uh, it's such a wonderful day, I can't imagine why anyone would be outside just to spend their time in here, but uh, it's my benefit, and I thank you. Um, as mentioned, uh, I have a story that uh, was very nicely produced in uh, Philadelphia Stories called uh, uh, My Dis uh, my heart blisters like a royal sausage. It's a cautionary tale of love and loss in the food industry. Um, Try to stay within the confines of the time limits. Um, instead of reading that, I thought I'd read uh, something a bit shorter, um, something that appeared in uh, Pacific Coast Journal uh, about two years ago. I'm sure many people's subscriptions have lapsed, so you may not have read this, so I thought it might not be a bit. I need to bring it. Excuse me, I'm just going to bring this a little closer. Are we here, by the way? Is it okay? Um, okay, so this is <clears throat> the story. Um, the title of the story is At the Bookstore, for example. I am a man to whom extraordinary things happen. Fabulous events transpire and I am at, the, at their center. The world revolves and I tremble in the strips, slipstream of the incredible. Remarkable moments flow through me as light passes through colored glass. I stand at the tremulous convergence of lines of force, tendrils of motion, wisps of cloudy and indistinct acts. If asked, I will tell you that the world exists because I exist. If it, is, if it wasn't for me, nothing very interesting would happen. At this juncture, you are ready to read the words, for example. You are now prepared to consider an instance of those extraordinary events that shape and are shaped by my being. As example of the extraordinary things in this man's life, you have reached this point in the story where anticipation of the phrase, for example, is all but a reflex. Undoubtedly, this is a result of the accumulation of years of reading stories in which extraordinary events and remarkable scenes are presented with the inevitability of sunset. Yours is, after all, a mind acutely attuned to detect the subtlest clue or most sophisticated hint of exposition. You are standing in the aisle of this large and well-lighted bookstore and have taken this volume from the shelf on a whim, a gust of curiosity, perhaps simply attracted by its brightly avant-garde cover. You have opened it to this story just as whimsically, perhaps perplexed by the exotic mystery of its title. It is possible, however, that you have chosen this book and this story because you have noticed an attractive woman or man standing further along this aisle, and you are eager for this person to notice your sophisticated and cultivated taste in contemporary literature. As you read these lines, you glance up as furtively as a teenager in a locker room, hoping you have been noticed by this desirable person. And you are eager to be noticed without being seen to be noticed. You are crafty. And since you are crafty, accidentally you drop this book to the floor. Without looking around, you quietly mutter a curse against yourself. Self-deprecating humor is a significant part of your arsenal of crafty devices to attract those <laughs> whose attention you desire. In this gesture, you notice that she or he is holding a book. You recognize its author's name and remember that you have read a review of this book with admiration. You remind yourself that because of the enthusiasm of the review, you have intended to read this author's work. But regrettably, for all the reasons preventing you from reading the works of other equally admirable authors, the work of this author remains simply another fragment among the confetti of brightly colored spines surrounding you. Thus, even while you look forward to examples of the extraordinary events that transpire during my daily life, you have found yourself speculating about this person sharing your aisle in this bookstore. Hurrah for you. You are displaying an ability only some humans possess, namely the ability to carry on two distinctly different mental operations simultaneously. So intertwined are these two mental acts, the anticipation of my examples of the extraordinary and speculation concerning the intellectual tastes and artistic sensibilities of this person on your aisle, that to think one is already to be prepared to think another. Though you may be unconvinced, you will have to trust me on this one. <clears throat> but just then, this person looks up. For an instant, your eyes are caught, your furtive glance is found out, panic clutches at your throat, you turn back to this page as desperately your eyes search for the phrase, for example. For example, the description of a train trip to a foreign country that resulted in an unanticipated encounter with a long-lost friend would strike you as extraordinary. Or the recounting of a mis misadventure involving illicit drugs and the police would also strike you as remarkable. A chance meeting in a remote and desolate countryside with a relatively well-known pop star, perhaps also in a foreign country, would fit your qualifications for an extraordinary moment. Even the chance discovery of a large denomination banknote on an infre 
infrequently traveled thoroughfare, especially if it happened in a foreign country, would also be admitted into your realm of the extraordinary. In fact, while your eyes search this text for the phrase, for example, a list grows in your mind of all the occurrences that would satisfy your expectations for an extraordinary event. The description of any of them would adequately follow the phrase, for example. You are certain that if you glance far enough along in this text, you will find the phrase, for example. And oddly, you almost hope that you do not. Because discovery of that phrase would obligate you to continue to read. Whereas your preference is to study the study further the person at the end of this aisle in this lovely large bookstore with suddenly intellectual music playing in the background. But finally you do look up, hoping that this person is low, no longer studying you, appraising you, and watching to catch your eye. And you are relieved, though you allow no outward sign, to discover that this person is now turned away, back facing you, and so blocks your view of the book, cover of the book that person is reading, but leaning one shoulder against the bookshelves, and in this way giving you ample opportunity study his or her back. And you do. You close this volume for a moment, your right finger, right index finger beside these words, and study the unobserved, unobserved the shape of shoulder, the curve of neck, the thickness of arm and waist, and depending on thickness of arm, and the style and panache of underwear and casing <laughs> and buttons. You appraise the shape, the thickness of thigh, the turn of calf, and even speculate on economic status based on style and brand of shoes. All of this you carry out quickly indifferent to the possibility that just beyond the periphery of your eyesight, someone may be watching you. But just then, this person shifts and straightens and then begins to turn in your direction. Quickly, you reopen this volume to the page, still held by your finger. Your eyes follow your finger, and at its end, you read these words. For example, several years ago, I was alone on an extended vacation. An old friend had recently married and was living with her new husband in Vienna. When she heard I was traveling, she invited me to meet her new husband and stay for a few days, promising they would show me the sights. I had never been to Vienna and was glad for the opportunity to visit, but I was even more curious to observe the newly married couple. I had never met them, but she was a woman of some years' acquaintance, and over those years had smoldered within my heart an unrequited desire. Profoundly voluptuous with dark, abundant dark hair and coquettish smile, she had featured in fantasies too prurient to describe so that the joyful news of her marriage had left me a bitter sting of regret. But this visit offered the opportunity to review these fantasies and perhaps finally put them to rest. Because you are an acute reader of contemporary fiction, you already suspect the tale of adultery cast against the backdrop of an exotic city, perhaps a series of night scenes in dingy rooms under unnatural light. You foresee all this and pause, and then you look up. She, or he, is gone. You return your finger to the place beside these words, you close this volume against your finger, and you sigh. You realize, of course, that this was the risk you took when finally you read the words, for example. <clears throat> Yet you are annoyed with yourself. You believe yourself sophisticated enough to carry out a bit of surreptitious surveillance within the civilized confines of a bookstore. This, at least, you can do. After all, you've had years to practice. A wave of despair passes over you. Attention diverted, you remind yourself that once again you have let slip an opportunity. An opportunity for what, you question yourself. An opportunity to be swept up by the accidental, the impromptu, the extraordinary. Cautiously, you step to the end of the aisle, and as if you are not, you look along in both directions, but that person is utterly gone. After a moment's regretful reflection, you make a mental note of this page number and tuck this book under your arm. With one eye on the bookshelves and the other on the aisles, you begin a slow browse. Up one aisle and down another, noting all the books by all of the authors whose names you recognize and whose works you have always intended to read. In this fashion, you reconnoiter the entire floor, but that person is not to be found. 